and welcome to my presentation covering the basics for Excel Combined Science Paper 3. As I said, this is only basic information, so it won't contain everything to get you up to a grade 9, but it should be able to get you up to about a grade 5. Do not just listen to this presentation, make sure you're taking notes or making mind maps or drawing diagrams. Um, if you don't understand a bit, pause it, rewind, re-listen to bits, and make sure you're practicing exam questions as well. So starting with topics 1 and 2, which is states of matter and separating mixtures. To begin with, if we look at some basic definitions, uh, we need to think about atoms. Atoms are normally uh, represented during uh, single circles like these. Uh, different colours represent different types of atom. And an atom is the smallest stable particle of matter. Atoms can join together to form molecules. A molecule is a particle made of two or more atoms bonded together. And they can be different types of atom or they can be the same types of atom that doesn't matter um, but they're two or more atoms bonded together an element is a substance made from only one type of atom so this is an element because it's only made from black atoms this is an element because it's only made from red atoms compounds are substances made from two or more types of atom bonded together Bonded just means joined. So if we look here, this is a compound because we've got red atoms and black atoms. This is a compound because we've got white atoms and black atoms. So two different types bonded together. Notice the different structures. So the one on the uh, the one on the left here is made of a lattice. This one is made of individual molecules, but they're both compounds because they've both got more than one type of atom. And lastly, we've got mixtures. A mixture is a substance made from two or more elements or compounds that are mixed but not bonded so if you look at this one on the uh, left here we've got one two three four different types of substance all mixed together but not bonded on the right we've got three types of substance all mixed together but again not bonded now, states of matter. The state of matter just describes whether something is solid, liquid or gas. And we need to understand the difference between the arrangement and motion of the particles and about how uh, they change from one state to another. So if we look at solid, first of all, that's this one here. Uh, you can see the particles are arranged in these kind of nice regular rows. And if you look very closely, you can see they're vibrating slightly. So they're not moving around from point to point, but vibrating around a fixed point. Liquids, such as here, we've got uh, the particles are still touching, but now they're in no order at all. They're sort of random all over the place uh, and they are moving past each other. And in gas, in gas, like we've got here, the particles are now no longer touching. They're completely randomly spaced. Uh, the particles are widely spaced uh, and um, the particles should be moving very fast. It doesn't show that clearly on this diagram. Now, in terms of change of state, um, going from, if we start with solid, going from solid to uh, liquid, we've got melting and liquid back to solid is freezing. Going from liquid to gas is evaporation or boiling. Either we get the mark and going from gas back to liquid is condensation. Going from gas to solid is called deposition. And going from solid back to gas is called sublimation. Now, if you take a substance, a solid substance, and you heat it and measure the temperature every few seconds, you get a graph like this one on the right, uh, bottom right hand corner. So the temperature, you can see it goes up and then it levels out it goes up and then it levels out. Now, these level sections are state changes. So in this first section, that is the solid melting. And in the second section, flat section, that is the liquid boiling. Now, during that time when it's boiling, the uh, when it's melting, what's happening is that the energy, rather than going into increasing the temperature, is going into breaking the weak intermolecular forces between the uh, molecules, the particles that are holding them together. Solubility. This describes whether something can dissolve or not. So a substance can be either soluble or insoluble. To say something is soluble means it dissolves 
and when something dissolves it means the particles spread out evenly throughout the liquid so if we look at um, our our sugar here we call that a solute the solute is the thing that's going to be dissolved and that's going to go into the water here the water is a solvent that is the liquid that something dissolves in and you can see here the yellow sugar has been spread evenly throughout the whole of our solution so the whole of our liquid and we call that a solution so a solution is a mixture of a solute dissolved in a solvent now that mixture bit is important because mixtures can be separated so what we can do with the solution is get the solute back out and end up with our solute and solvent as we started insoluble just means that a substance does not dissolve some substances are soluble in some solvents, but not in others. To separate uh, mixtures, we need to think about their properties. So the first two approaches we're going to look at are filtration and crystallization. So filtration separates insoluble solids from liquids. So we're thinking something like a mixture of, say, sand and water uh, or water and, say, some insoluble metal oxide or something. And all you do is you get your mixture and you pour it into a filter paper. Now the filter paper, if you look at the microscopic structure, has lots of tiny little holes in it, okay? And those tiny little holes are small enough for the liquid to pass through, but uh, the holes are too small for the solid particles to, to fall through. So the solid remains behind here. We call the solid the residue, and we call the liquid that filters through is called the filtrate. Crystallization separates the solids from a solution so the idea here is that we're going to heat the solution until all the liquid evaporates and the solid remains behind but just look at the way we do it we don't heat the we don't heat the um, solution directly because if we do that what happens is it will boil so vigorously that we get all these little bits that will just spit out and which is a quite dangerous because they're very hot and b means we lose the solid that we're trying to collect so instead what we do is we heat it indirectly so we get this um, uh, beaker full of water and we heat the beaker until the water boils and the steam then rises up and it heats the beaker from below which allows the uh, solution to get hot without boiling so it evaporates quickly but it doesn't boil so it doesn't spit little bits out and once we've reduced the volume of the of the uh, solution by enough we won't continue heating it anymore. What we'll do then is we'll just remove it from the heat and leave it somewhere warm to evaporate over a few days to give us some nice crystals. Distillation is used to separate out liquids from mixtures. So there's simple distillation here and fractional distillation. Simple distillation allows us to collect a liquid from a solution with a solid. So for example, you might have um, a uh, solution of seawater and you want to collect the water from that seawater. It works like this, so you uh, heat your liquid in say a round bottom flask like that and what you do is you pass the vapours through this thing here. This thing here is called a condenser and what happens in a condenser is we put cold water in there and the water comes out there and that cold water provides a nice cool surface for all these vapours that are rising up when they hit that cold surface they condense and you can see they form these droplets of liquid and the droplets of liquid come out and we collect them at the end. Fractional distillation is used to separate mixtures of two different liquids together. So for example let's imagine you had a mixture of uh, ethanol and water. This would allow you to collect one pot of ethanol and one pot of water. And it has the same uh, basic setup as simple distillation with the addition of a fractionating column um, and the fractionating column what it does is it allows for a sort of better temperature gradient so it makes sure that you get a better separation between these two different liquids note that in both types of distillation we also have a thermometer a thermometer is useful because it lets us monitor the uh, temperature which tells us something about what's being produced so if for example we're collecting liquid in the flask here then the temperature here will read 100 degrees celsius which is the boiling point of water if we were collecting ethanol in the flask here the temperature here would read 78 degrees celsius because that is the boiling point of ethanol paper chromatography is used to separate mixtures 
mostly of liquids but sometimes of uh, of other solutions too but it's about doing it on a small scale this isn't about collecting bulk amounts of stuff but more about separating mixtures uh, just to check what is in them and it works like this so you have your chromatography paper that's the the paper here we call the paper the stationary phase so stationary phase and then we have some kind of solvent which we call the mobile phase now what we do then is on our stationary phase we draw a line in pencil uh, about two centimeters from the bottom um, and it has to be in pencil because pencil is insoluble the graphite is insoluble so it won't move up the paper um, and we place a spot of a sample that we want to separate on that pencil line then we put the paper um, into some solvent and as you can see on the on the uh, on the little gif the solvent soaks up the paper and as it does so the substances in the spot move up as well okay but the distance they move up depends on how soluble they are so things that are more soluble like the red spot move further than things that are less soluble like the black spot so this takes our original sample and separates it out into multiple different spots with each spot representing a different substance what we can do is we can measure a quantity called RF so RF is given here it stands for retardation factor and that is the distance moved by the compound divided by the distance moved by the solvent so it's going to give a number between 1 and 0 1 being the maximum 0 being the lowest and it is super simple you just measure that distance there the distance traveled by the um, solvent and the distance traveled by your sample and you divide one by the other uh, so that you can see it happening here so 6 divided by 10 will give you an RF of 0 0.6 we did a core practical with this so we investigated uh, ways to separate ink one of them was a simple distillation so we didn't use all the fancy condenser and things we used a, a setup that does the same job so we just had a delivery tube coming out of a test tube and going into a beaker of ice and so we put some ink in the bottom here it was black ink i think was the one that we used and um, so we put some black ink in the flask we heated it and passed the vapors into that ice bath and the ice condensed the vapors back to a liquid we also did chromatography on some different colored uh, pens so we drew a pencil line near the bottom we placed the inks placed an ink spot on the pencil line we put the paper in some water making sure the water was below the level of the ink spot and then we waited for the water to rise up the paper and we measured the distances that the ink spots traveled and calculated the RFs. This is quite a messy practical. You don't get nice clear spots. If you look at that, you get something like these sort of big smudges, but it's still enough to see the basic principle. We can still see the colors separating out. Topics three to four are on atomic structure on the so now we'll look at the structure of atoms and a reminder that an atom is the smallest stable particle of matter atoms are made of particles that are smaller than that called subatomic particles and there are three of them protons neutrons and electrons so to start with a proton protons have a mass of one and a charge of plus one we find them in the nucleus of an atom uh, and the number of them is given by the atomic number more on that later we have neutrons neutrons have a mass of one and a charge of zero that's why they're called neutrons because they are neutral they are also found in the nucleus and they have an atomic uh, the number of them rather is given by the atomic mass take away the atomic number and lastly we've got electrons electrons have a mass of one over 1835 so it's a really tiny mass a charge of minus one uh, we find them in shells orbiting the nucleus and they're given by the atomic number and if we look at the actual structure here so we can see that we've got this structure of atoms where the protons and the neutrons are in this middle section that is the nucleus and then we've got our electrons orbiting around uh, in these shells here okay now this diagram is not drawn to scale to scale the nucleus is one ten thousandth the diameter of the electron shells so to put that into perspective if the if you picture the London eye um, the, the the ring of the London eye is the shells and the nucleus would be the size of a pea at the center of that the periodic table uh, is used to organize all the elements that we know and it is arranged in order of increasing atomic number so you can see atomic number one there two three four and so on now on the periodic table we have these columns so we've got 
the first one, second one, and so on. We call the columns groups. So we've got group one, group two, big gap. Don't worry about this big gap here. We can sort of ignore those for now. Then we have group three, group four, group five, and so on. Note here, hydrogen doesn't really belong in any particular group because hydrogen is fairly unique as an element. Um, we also have periods. Now, periods are the rows on the periodic table. Hydrogen doesn't have a group, but it does have a period. It is in the first period, so period one, period two, and so on. There are also other things you should know, um, for example, where the metals and non-metals are found. So if we start here and draw a stepped line down, okay, like that, zigzag, 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 okay? Everything over here, these are the non-metals. And everything over on this side is metals. And you can see there are a lot more metals than non-metals. So if we look at the uh, the cells that are on the periodic table, so each one of these boxes, we'll see we've got these two numbers. So for example, this, this element here is beryllium, and we've got a 9 and a 4. Um, that 9 and the 4, the atomic mass is the name we give to that number 9. So that is the top number. Uh, and that is the number of protons and neutrons combined together. So if we want to calculate the number of neutrons in the uh, in the atom, we just do the atomic mass, take away the atomic number. So in this case, it's 9 minus 4 makes 5 neutrons. The bottom number is called the atomic number. Okay, And that gives us the number of protons. So the atomic number here is 4, so beryllium has 4 protons. It also tells us the number of electrons, so beryllium also has 4 electrons. And just one last little note, look at the way the symbol is written. Okay, It starts with a capital. Most, some symbols have a second letter, some don't. If it has a second letter, the second letter must be a lower case. Now, Electron configuration. This describes the way that electrons are organized in shells around an atom. So there's a very specific structure to it. And we have this, these layers of shells. You can see, for example, here, lithium has got one, two uh, shells. Chlorine here has got one, two, three shells. Now, the first shell can hold up to two electrons. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons. And the third shell can also hold up to eight electrons. That is not strictly true. That's a white lie we teach you. And you'll learn more about that at A level should you go further with this. Now, look at this in practice. So let's take lithium here. Lithium, lithium has uh, an atomic number of three. That means it's got three electrons. So two of them go into the first shell. The first shell is now full. So you get go on to the next shell now and put the remaining electron in there. We can write that electron configuration as 2.1, like that. Okay. Um, if we look at chlorine here, chlorine has uh, this symbol Cl, 35.5 and 17. So it's got 17 electrons. So two of them go in the first shell. Okay. Then we get eight in the second shell. Then we still have another seven left over, so seven go into that last shell. So we can write that as 2.8.7. Okay. Now, there is a way to check this. The periodic table tells us the electrical configuration of an atom because the group number is the number of electrons in the outer shell. And the period number is the number of shells the atom's got. So if we look at lithium here, lithium okay, is in the first group okay, and the second period. So it's got two shells because it's in the second period and one electron in the outer shell because it's in the first group. If we look at chlorine, chlorine is here. That's in the third period and it's in group seven okay so third period means it has three shells one two three and uh, group seven means it has seven electrons in the outer shell one two three four five six seven now isotopes are different versions of an element with the same atomic number and different atomic mass 
that is also the same as saying they have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons okay so for example there are three isotopes of carbon carbon 12 carbon 13 and carbon 14 that number that we uh, we we use when we write uh, these isotopes that is just the atomic mass okay so carbon 12 carbon 13 carbon 14 because they're all carbons they've all got the same atomic number which means they've all got six protons and six electrons and you can see that here six protons six protons six protons what's different is the atomic mass which means they've got different numbers of neutrons so carbon 12 has got 12 minus 6 to give you 6 neutrons. Carbon 13 has got 13 minus 6 to give you 7 neutrons. And carbon 14 has got 14 minus 6, which is 8 neutrons. Chemically, these things are the same. They do all the same reactions. It is their physical properties that tend to be slightly different. Topics 5 to 7, bonding and structure. This covers ionic bonding, covalent bonding and metallic bonding. Ionic bonding. Bonding is about how atoms join together. And in ionic bonding, it's to do with the formation of ions. Now, an ion is an atom with a positive or negative charge, and they're formed by gaining or losing electrons. We have cations. They are positive ions formed by losing electrons, and it is metals that form those. We also have anions, which are negative ions formed by gaining electrons, and those are formed by non-metals. To remember which way is which, just remember that cations are positive. Now, an ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between a positive and a negative ion. So it's between a cation and an anion. And they form by electrons being transferred from a metal atom to a non-metal atom, leaving a metal as a cation and the non-metal as an anion. And we can see that happening in this example here. So if we look at lithium, which is a metal, uh, and fluorine, which is a non-metal, lithium's one electron in its outer shell gets transferred over to fluorine. That leaves lithium with just two electrons in one shell, which is the full shell, because it's the first shell. And it means that fluorine now has eight electrons in its outer shell. So that's full as well. Lithium has this plus charge here. Fluorine has this minus charge here. So there's an electrostatic force between the two. And now they've formed an ionic bond to make lithium fluoride. Now, ionic compounds form a what's called a lattice structure. Now, this here is a lattice structure. That is a repeating three-dimensional pattern of, in this case, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. And it repeats up and down, left and right, and in and out, in three dimensions. And if you think about a single grain of salt, for example, this pattern is repeated many, many billions of times in each direction. Now, um, these things have a high melting point. That's because in order to, um, you know, when something's melted, it means the ions are free to move around. And that requires you to break these very strong, electrostatic forces between the ions. Now, these things do not conduct electricity when they are solid. That's because when they're solid, these ions cannot move. You know, they're locked tightly in place. However, if you melt them or dissolve them to make them liquid, then ionic compounds do conduct electricity because the ions would then be free to move around. Covalent bonding. This is bonding involving shared pairs of electrons okay so a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons um, to go into detail is, is, is take, takes a long time with this so I think there's a real case here for just memorizing each of these structures so these are the ones the syllabus requires you to know hydrogen hydrogen sorry, hydrogen hydrogen chloride oxygen carbon dioxide and methane and uh, if you look at just some of the key ideas, these are drawn as overlapping circles. So each, we just draw the outer shell electrons and each circle represents an outer shell. Um, and the 
bond itself is the uh, is the overlapping is the pair of electrons in the overlapping section. So that blue bit that I've just circled, that is uh, a covalent bond. And you can see that each atom ends up with a full outer shell. So um, the electrons in this pair count for both atoms. So they'll orbit this, this atom here. They'll also orbit this atom here like that. Okay. Um, with hydrogen chloride, same kind of thing, but with a hydrogen and chlorine, you can see chlorine's outer shell ends up full because it has eight electrons. Hydrogen's outer shell ends up full because it has two electrons. Remember, hydrogen just has two electrons in its outer shell when it's completely full. Um, oxygen and carbon dioxide, you'll notice they're a little more complicated because they've got two pairs of electrons in their overlapping sections. We call that a double bond. There is also such a thing as a triple bond, but you do not need to know about it. So, oh dear, my computer can't write. Uh, it's called a double bond. Okay. And then we've got methane here, probably the most complicated one you need to know about. Um, you sometimes also see in exam questions, they'll draw you, ask you for tetrafluoromethane, which looks similar to, to, um, to methane, but with fluorines arranged around the outside like this. So we have F, 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 F. It's similar in as much as we've got uh, the same number of dots and crosses. But the thing to remember is to fill in the outer shells on our fluorine to make sure that each fluorine ends up with eight electrons in the outer shell. But other, other than that, it's very similar to methane. Now, some substances with covalent bonds form what are called a simple molecular structure. A simple molecular structure is one made of molecules. Now a molecule is a particle made of a few atoms covalently bonded together. So that's normally somewhere between about two and about 20 atoms bonded together. Um, uh, so you can see that as an example here is water. So this is made, this is H2O. You can see the little grey ones are the hydrogens and the red ones are the oxygens. And a water molecule is just that. It's just those three atoms bonded together. Now these things have low melting points. The reason for that is because when they're in the solid or liquid form, they're held together by these weak forces of attraction that I'm just circling here called intermolecular forces. Now those forces are weak, so you don't need much energy to break them, which is why they have low melting points. They do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons that are free to move. The alternative for covalent compounds is a giant molecular structure. Now, a giant molecular structure is a repeating three dimensional pattern of atoms joined by covalent bonds. So this is quite like the ionic lattice formed by ionic compounds. So it's just a repeating pattern. Um, and some examples of things that form this kind of structure, silicon dioxide, diamond and graphite. Now what you can here, see here is silicon uh, dioxide. So the reds are oxygens and the black ones are silicons. Okay. And uh, the formula of this is SiO2, silicon dioxide. And this pattern just repeats over and over again. So you can see that each oxygen has two bonds to a silicon and each silicon has four bonds to an oxygen. And that pattern just repeats again and again and again. Now these have high melting points because to allow these atoms to start moving past each other, you need to break all of these strong covalent bonds. Every one of those bonds needs to break to melt it. And that requires a lot of energy because they are strong bonds. They do not conduct electricity because there are no electrons that are free to move. The one exception to that is graphite. Now, polymers. Polymers are a type of covalent uh, compound that form very, very large molecules. But importantly, they're large molecules made from many smaller ones joined together. You can imagine these a bit like a necklace made of beads. Each bead is very small, but the necklace could be very big because it's they're all joined together. Okay. Now we call the small molecules that get joined together. They're called monomers. Okay. And they join together to form polymers. You can see here, each monomer is small, but the overall polymer is big because it's made of lots of them joined together. And we have lots of examples of this in nature. So the proteins that uh, 
we get from our meat and dairy. Uh, they are made from amino acid monomers joined together. The starch that we find in you know, rice and bread and potatoes and whatever is made from lots of glucose monomers joined together. So these polymers are really important uh, compounds. Last kind of bonding we need to think about is metallic bonding. Metallic bonding is the bonding we see in metals. And the important thing here is that in a metal, the outer shell electrons get delocalized. Now this word here, delocalized, means that the electrons in the outer shells aren't bound to one atom, but are free to move around many. So if we take this electron here in a normal substance, that electron will just spend its entire life just whizzing around and around and around the same old boring atom. Okay, But in a metal, that electron is delocalized, which means it can just move wherever it likes. It just goes on a magical mystery tour around all of the atoms. Okay, Now that is going to be important when we think about the properties. Okay. So, this leaves each of the metal atoms as a positive ion because it's lost its outer shell electrons. Okay? So, a metallic bond then is the attraction between a lattice of metal ions and this cloud of delocalized electrons that's whizzing about everywhere. Okay? Now, really importantly, metals conduct electricity and the reason why is because those electrons are free to move you can see that happening here you can see in this little gif the, the electrons can just move uh, from negative towards positive so that's why metals conduct electricity topic eight acids and alkalis in which we discuss the ph scale the reactions of acids core practicals and precipitation reactions the pH scale tells us how acid or alkali something is. Just note how that's written, first of all, um, capital uh, H, but a lowercase p. Uh, anything with a pH of 0 to 6 is acid. pH 7 is neutral, and pH 8 to 14 is alkali. Very strong acid is pH 0. Very strong alkali is pH 14. Um, we can tell the pH using indicators, which are dyes that change colour depending on the pH. There are four we need to know about, so we need to know about litmus, which is red in acid and blue in alkali, methyl orange, which is red in acid and yellow in alkali, and phenolphthalein, which is colourless in acid and a glorious bright pink in alkali. And the last one we've got is universal, which has this whole range of colour changes. So universal indicator is uh, red in very strong acid, it sort of goes through orange, then kind of yellow, then green for neutral, then sort of turquoisey blue for a weak alkali, and then this 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 deep deep uh, bluey purple for um, uh, a strong alkali. It has a range of colour changes because it's made of a mixture of lots of different indicators. Um, useful to get a general idea of the pH, but not so useful for things like titrations where we need to know exactly uh, when something starts being uh, an alkaline starts being an acid. Um, we can measure pH more accurately using pH meters, um, which are little electronic devices that you can dip into the solution and you get a digital readout. So um, it gives a much more accurate measurement of the pH. So 5.32, not just 5 or 6. Acids, bases and salts. This slide is about giving us some basic definitions so we can use these terms uh, properly later. So to start with acids. So acids are substances that dissolve to make a solution with a pH of less than seven. Um, there are three that we need to know about. So sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and hydrochloric acid. Um, importantly, these will all make types of salts when they get neutralized. And sulfuric acid makes a sulfate salt. Nitric acid makes nitrate salts. And hydrochloric acid makes chloride salts. In terms of their formulas, hydrochloric acid, um, so sulfuric acid rather, is H2SO. Four. Nitric acid is HNO3 and hydrochloric acid is HCl. Note they've all got this H in there. That's because when they dissolve, they make hydrogen ions, H+, and that is the thing that actually makes them acids. Bases are substances that neutralise acids to make a salt and water. That word neutralise means uh, bring the pH up to 7 so they stop being acids anymore. So there are three types of base we need to know about. So we have metal hydroxides, metal oxides and metal carbonates. Metal hydroxides 
could be things like um, lithium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, copper hydroxide, and so on. And they all featured this ion here, the OH minus ion, like that. Okay. So we might have um, lithium hydroxide, which is LiOH. We could have um, magnesium hydroxide, Mg, with two of those OHs, so OH2, like that in brackets. Um, metal oxides, they all just feature an oxygen 2 minus ion, like this. So we could have uh, Na2O, that's sodium oxide. We might have copper oxide, CuO, and so on. And then last one we've got is metal carbonates. They all feature the CO3 2 minus ion. So, for example, calcium carbonate CaCO3, uh, magnesium carbonate MgCO3, and so on. And finally, a salt. A salt is a compound produced when an acid is neutralized um, by a base. So, for example, sodium chloride copper nitrate, calcium sulfate. Now, look at this second part of the names of these salts. That tells you the acid they're made from. So, a chloride must be made from hydrochloric acid, because we said they make chloride salts. A nitrate must be made from nitric acid, because nitric acid makes nitrate salts. And a sulfate must be made from uh, sulfuric acid because they make sulfate salts, okay? And the last thing that's worth pointing out, I use a different color because it's getting a bit busy. The last thing that's worth pointing out is that the first part of the name comes from the base that we're working with. So whatever the metal part of the base uh, is, gives us the first half of the name of the salt. So um, for example, if we had uh, um, sodium, hydroxide reacting, the salt is going to be sodium something. If we had copper carbonate, the salt would be copper something, and so on. So um, the name of the base and acid combined together to give us the name of the um, uh, salt. In terms of the reactions of acids, there are three reactions of acids with bases that we need to know about. The first is the reaction with metal hydroxides. So metal hydroxide plus acid makes a salt and water. So in this example, we're going to have sodium hydroxide is our metal hydroxide, okay, reacting with nitric acid. And it's going to make sodium nitrate and water. Okay. Now if we look at the name of this, the reason it's something nitrate is because we had nitric acid to start with, okay? And nitric acid makes nitrate salts. And the reason it's sodium nitrate rather than, I know, lead or potassium nitrate, whatever, is because we started with sodium hydroxide. So the metal in the hydroxide gives us the first part of the salt name, and it's the acid that gives us the second part of the salt name. The reaction of acids with metal oxides is uh, very similar, actually. So we, the metal oxide plus acid again makes salt and water. So this time, for example, we could have magnesium oxide making sulfuric acid. So uh, magnesium oxide plus sulfuric acid making magnesium sulfate and water. And again, if we look at the name of this salt here, okay, it, the metal from the base is giving us the first part of the name. And this, the acid is giving us the second part, because remember, sulfuric acid makes sulfate salt, so we've got that sulfate bit there, and the magnesium is coming from the base over here. And the last reaction we need is the reaction with metal carbonates. So a metal carbonate plus acid makes salt plus water plus carbon dioxide, and that's important. So with carbonates, because we're making a gas, we'll see the reaction bubbling uh, really vigorously as well. Okay. Now, in this example, we've got calcium carbonate making, uh, so plus hydrochloric acid, making calcium chloride plus water plus carbon dioxide. And again, note where the name is coming from. So we've got calcium carbonate. So calcium is the metal in our base. And so the metal part of the salt name will be calcium as well. Okay. And because it's hydrochloric acid, it's going to be a chloride salt.
Okay. I won't go into detail on making balanced equations for this because, as I said at the start of the presentation, this is basics only, and explaining the um, uh, symbol equations is much more involved. We did a core practical in which we prepared copper sulfate crystals from uh, copper oxide and sulfuric acid, and it worked like this. We started off with some sulfuric acid, which we heated without boiling before the um, reaction actually started. Then what we did was one spatula at a time, we added copper oxide, and then after each spatula, we stirred it until it dissolved. And then we just repeated these two steps until um, adding a little bit of copper oxide each time, stirring it until it dissolved, and then repeating that until it stopped dissolving. And the way we knew it wasn't dissolving anymore was it went black and cloudy, because copper oxide is a black powder, okay? Now, after that, because we had uh, the black cloudy bit was, was lots of undissolved copper oxide uh, just floating around in the solution. So, so to get rid of that, we filtered the solution and then we evaporated the liquid to leave crystals. Uh, in terms of the details of that evaporation, you can see that happening up here. So um, what you would do with that is heat the evaporating basin indirectly over a beaker of boiling water. Um, remove about half of the water from the solution and then leave it somewhere warm to dry over a few days. The second core practical on the acids topic involved investigating how the pH of an acid changed as you added small amounts of a base to it. So we started with placing 50 centimeters cubed of an acid in a beaker and we measure the initial pH with universal indicator paper um, and again you can see the colour changes you get from that up here. Um, then we add in 0.3 grams of calcium hydroxide and we stirred it until it dissolved and we retested the pH again with the uh, pH, the universal indicator paper. We repeated this a further seven times so we ended up adding a total of 2.4 grams of calcium hydroxide in 0.3 gram increments and after each one we measured the pH again. And the last thing we did was we produced a graph of the pH versus the mass of hydroxide added and it produced a graph that looks like this one which goes up gently at first then rises very steeply and then rises more gently again after that sort of neutralization period. Uh, in the middle, that's where it's getting neutralised. Um, not a brilliantly accurate experiment because measuring the pH is inaccurate. Um, it would be more accurate with a pH meter. Now, a precipitation reaction is one in which uh, mixing two soluble salts produces an insoluble one. You can always tell a precipitation reaction because it goes cloudy. Okay. For example, potassium iodide and lead nitrate makes lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Lead iodide, you can actually see, is the bright yellow stuff being made here. So that is our precipitate. Topics 10 to 12. This is about electrolysis, metals and reversible reactions. Electrolysis is using direct electric current, that's current that flows in one direction only, to break down ionic compounds into the elements they're made from. Now in terms of some of the basic language, an electrolyte is the thing that gets electrolyzed. It must be a liquid ionic compound and that liquid uh, means it's either dissolved, so take some salt and dissolve it in water, or it is molten, so get some table salt and heat it very, very strongly until it melts. Um, we put into the electrolyte two electrodes. You can see the electrodes here and here. So electrodes um, are uh, electrically conducting materials that carry the charge into the electrolyte and we have two electrodes we have the cathode that is the negative electrode and we have the anode which is the positive one so you can see the cathode here and the anode there so cathode is negative and the anode is positive okay now 
because the cathode is negative, cations, positive ions, will be attracted towards it. Okay, and what happens? Uh, the cations get discharged. That means they lose their charge. So for a cation to lose its charge, it must gain electrons. So cations are discharged at the cathode by gaining electrons, and that produces a metal. So if that was a zinc ion, we'd make zinc metal at the cathode here. If it was a lead ion, we'd make lead metal at the cathode, and so on. Now, at the anode, because the anode is positive, negative ions will be attracted to it. And again, they will be discharged. They will lose their charge. And they do that by losing electrons. And that produces a non-metal. And normally the non-metal is in a gaseous form. So normally at the anode, we'll get bubbles of you know, oxygen gas or chlorine gas or bromine gas or something like that. Our core practical on the electrolysis of copper sulphate was to investigate how the rate of electrolysis is affected by the current. And to do this, we set up an electrolytic cell with copper sulphate uh, as our electrolyte and copper metal electrodes. And we started by cleaning and weighing each electrode. And then we attached it to a DC power supply. So that's a direct current power supply. So if I just complete the cell, the electrolytic cell here, so we've got our DC power supply. We just draw that as a as a battery like this. So that is positive. That is negative. OK, um, and we use a variable resistor to adjust the current to 0 0.1 amps. So we can add a little variable resistor to our circuit. There we go. There's a resistor a variable with the arrow like that. OK, the point of that variable resistor is to let us adjust the amount of current that flows through the circuit. And we ran the cell for 15 minutes. Then what we did at the end was we cleaned and reweighed each electrode. Okay, and what we found was that the positive electrode, the anode, loses mass. Okay, and the cathode gains mass. Okay, and importantly, the sort of the result of the experiment is that the greater the current, the bigger this change in mass. Reactivity is about how many reactions an element does and how quickly it does them. So a very reactive substance like potassium does a huge range of reactions very, very quickly, often explosively. A very unreactive element like gold does very few reactions and the ones it does, it does very slowly. Um, and we summarize this in the reactivity series. So the reactivity series starts with potassium, then goes sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc, iron, copper, silver, and gold. That's not the whole reactivity series, but that is the bit of it that you're expected to memorize. You'll note we've got carbon and hydrogen in here. They're not metals, but we you put them in there anyway because um, we find that their reactivity is important to compare to the metals. Um, some examples of this, um, potassium to calcium. Okay, so these guys are our most reactive metals. They react just if you drop them into liquid water. Okay. Magnesium to iron, they will still react with water, but it has to be hot in the form of steam. Whereas these guys at the bottom, copper, silver and gold, okay, they do not react with water at all, no matter how hot you make it. So that's just showing the idea that at the top, their metals are very reactive and at the bottom, they're very unreactive. Now, reactivity helps us to explain displacement reactions. Displacement reactions are one in which a more reactive metal displaces a less reactive metal from a compound. And this word displace means uh, takes the place of. OK, so, for example, if we look at this one down here, this reaction here, we've got copper sulfate and zinc making zinc sulfate and copper. And the reason this works is because if we look at zinc, zinc is here in the reactivity series and copper is here in the reactivity series. So zinc is a more reactive metal than copper. So zinc, because it's more reactive, can displace the copper. It can boot the copper out of the copper sulfate to make zinc sulfate 
and leave poor old copper metal on its own. Okay. As you do this reaction, you will see brown, ready brown copper metal being formed. You'll also see the blue colour of copper sulphate will disappear because the copper sulphate is being replaced by zinc sulphate, which is colourless. Um, so that is blue and that is colourless. So you get colour change too. Okay. Now this reaction does not work the other way around. If we had zinc sulphate and copper, okay, because copper is less reactive than the zinc, it cannot displace the zinc. So in displacement reactions, a more reactive metal will displace the less reactive metal from a compound. Redox reactions. This is about two ideas that happen together called oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is when a substance gains oxygen and reduction is when a substance loses oxygen. So an example of oxidation is rusting. So in rust, um, iron and oxygen react together to make iron oxide. You can see that rust on these nails here. Reduction is the opposite process whereby um, a compound loses oxygen. So this is this is used in the extraction of metals for example. Um, aluminium is found naturally in the form of aluminium oxide and it can be reduced to make aluminium and just oxygen on its own. So the aluminium oxide has lost the uh, oxygen to become aluminium. Um, and these combine together to make redox reactions. So in a redox reaction a reduction and an oxidation happen at the same time. Metals are not found naturally in their pure form for the most part, but are found as rocks called ores, which contain compounds of the metal. Um, only the metals down here can ever be found in their pure form. All the others exist as these ores. Okay? Uh, so ores can be extracted from metals in two different ways. One is by heating them with carbon. So this only works for metals that are less reactive than carbon, and it is both a displacement reaction and a redox reaction. So for example, if we take some iron oxide and react it with carbon, we heat it very, very strongly with carbon, we make carbon dioxide and iron. This is a displacement reaction because the carbon displaces the iron because it is more reactive than the iron. You can see carbon is here in the reactive series iron is here. Okay. It is also a redox reaction because the carbon gains oxygen and ends up being oxidized and the iron loses oxygen so it gets reduced. The alternative way of extracting metals and this is for um, metals that are more reactive than carbon is electrolysis. So what we do is we take our metal compound and we heat it until it's molten and we stick it into a very, very large electrolytic cell like this. And the uh, metal is reduced. So the metal loses its oxygen and becomes um, a, a liquid metal uh, in most cases. Uh, for example, aluminium oxide gets reduced to become aluminium and oxygen and the oxygen bubbles away out of the um, out of the electrolytic cell and the aluminium collects as molten aluminium at the bottom of the cell as you can see here. Reversible reactions are ones that can go backwards as well as forwards so the reactants can turn into products but the products can also turn back into reactants um, and this leads to a situation called dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium happens when the forwards and backwards reactions happen at the same rate. Um, and that leads to a state where the concentrations of products and reactants remain constant. An example of this is the production of ammonia. So when we make ammonia, nitrogen and hydrogen react together to make ammonia. That's the forwards reaction. But also the ammonia splits back up into nitrogen and hydrogen. That is the backwards reaction. And note we use this symbol here to show that that is a double arrow. So it looks like that. Note that the arrows have single heads, not double heads. Um, so the forward reaction in this case is nitrogen and hydrogen making ammonia, and the backwards reaction is ammonia making nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, this is done on an industrial scale in the harbour process, um, which uses high pressure to make more product, uh, an iron catalyst to make the reaction faster, and a high temperature to make a faster reaction. Um, this here is just showing 
graphically what happens. So the rate of the forward reaction starts off quick and gradually decreases and the rate of the backwards reaction starts off slow and gradually increases and they meet in the middle at the same rate. Topic 9 mass calculations. This looks at calculating relative formula mass, um, looks at empirical formulas, calculating percentage composition by mass, reacting masses and mole calculations. To calculate MR, which is the relative formula mass of a substance, we're going to add up the masses of all of the atoms it contains. So if we think about a three-step process, we're going to start by constructing the calculation, uh, where we're going to write the symbol of each atom and multiply by the number of them present and put plus signs in between. Then we're going to substitute with the uh, relative atomic masses. Um, and the final thing we're going to do is to complete the actual sum. So an example of this, if we were calculating MR for magnesium nitrate, we're going to construct it properly first of all. So we're going to say MR and then in brackets MgNO32, like that, okay, equals 1 times magnesium plus 2 times nitrogen because although there's one nitrogen the nitrogen is in the brackets and there's two outside the brackets so there's two nitrogens in total so times two nitrogen so two times m for that okay um, and then we're going to add that to six oxygens because there are three oxygens here but because there's two of the brackets we're going to have three times two to make six oxygens okay the next thing it says is to substitute with the relative atomic masses. This will normally be given to you in the question, but if it's not, you can look it up on the periodic table. So for magnesium, that is 24. So 1 times 24 plus 2 times 14 for nitrogen plus 6 times 16 for oxygen. Okay. And if you just stick that all into the calculator in one long string, you will end up with an answer of 1 four eight so the mr for magnesium nitrate is 148 an empirical formula is the molecular formula of a compound re-expressed as a ratio in its simplest terms and to do this we're going to follow three steps so the first thing is to identify the highest common factor of the numbers in the formula then divide each number by the highest common factor and then rewrite the formula so we'll start with uh, this one example here, N2H4, which is hydrazine. Okay. Um, so N2H4, the highest common factor of 2 and 4 is 2, because both 2 and 4 can be divided by 2. Okay. So then I divide each number by the highest common factor. So my nitrogen is going to be 2 divided by 2 equals 1. And for hydrogen, it will be 4 divided by 2 equals 2. So I'm going to have my formula is going to be NH2. Because there was 1N, I don't put a number there. I just leave it as N. A more difficult one this time. So this here is glucose. Okay. So glucose is C6H12O6. The highest common factor of 6, 12 and 6 is 6, because each of those numbers can be divided by 6. So the highest common factor equals 6. So for carbon, I'm going to do 6 divided by 6 equals 1. For hydrogen, I'm going to do 12 divided by 6 equals 2. And for oxygen, I'm going to do 6 divided by 6 equals uh, 1. So my empirical formula, rewriting that formula, is going to be C... H2O. And again, just a reminder that because the C and the O are both ones, we don't put a number in the equation. Okay. Now, sometimes, as in this case, the highest common factor of your things is one. So um, the only number that two, one, and four can be divided by is one. So if the highest common factor equals 1, then your empirical formula and your molecular formula are going to be the same thing. Percentage composition by mass. 
uh, question to asking us what percentage of the mass of um, a compound is coming from one particular element so in this case it's asking what is the percentage by mass of iron in iron 3 oxide okay to do this we are going to first of all multiply the mass the relative atomic mass of the element by the number of them in the formula there are two ions in the formula for iron oxide so we're going to multiply the mass of iron by two then we're going to divide that by the relative mass of the overall formula and then times by 100 to make percent so let's see how this looks in practice so we're going to say the percentage of fe equals the first thing is to do the mass of the element multiplied by the number in the formula so the mass of iron is 56 that's been given in the question but you might need to find it from the periodic table so we're going to do 56 times by 2 because we've got two ions in the formula times by 2 okay we're going to divide that by the relative formula mass of iron oxide fe203 so let's just work that out down here so we're going to say uh, relative formula mass of fe203 equals two times iron two times fe plus three times oxygen three times 16 okay um so let me get my working script three times oxygen Okay, so iron has a mass of 56, so that's going to be 2 times 56. Uh, oxygen has a mass of 16, so we're going to see 3 times 16. Add that together, we get 160. Okay, so we're dividing our amount of iron by the MR, so we're going to have 56 times 2 divided by 160. We're going to times that by 100 to make it into percent. And if we do that, we end up with 70% as our final answer. Now, sometimes you will need to determine the empirical formula of a compound from experimental data. For example, it says uh, two grams of a sample of a compound is found to contain 1.5 grams of carbon, with the rest being hydrogen, determine the empirical formula. So to do this, we're going to write out the symbols as a ratio. Okay. Um, and this ratio presentation is going to really help us, so it's important to stick with it. Then we're going to write in the masses that are given, divide each mass by the relative atomic mass of the element, then divide each answer by the smallest answer, and then we, get, we finally can write the empirical formula. So let's start by writing out the symbols as a ratio. So in this case, um, we're talking about carbon and hydrogen. So the symbols for that are C for carbon, and H for hydrogen. We're just going to put a dot dot in the middle to remind us it's a ratio. Okay. Then write in the masses that we are given. So step two now. Carbon's easy. It tells us it's 1.5 grams. Okay. But for hydrogen, it's a little more complicated because it doesn't tell us the number. It just says the rest of it is hydrogen. So if two grams was the whole sample and 1.5 grams is carbon, the hydrogen is going to be 2.0 minus 1.5 which equals 0.5. Sometimes the questions will give you um, both the masses straight up and sometimes you will have to work one out. So we've gone for a more difficult one here just so you can see how that would work. Um, then it says to divide each mass by the relative atomic mass of the element. So we're dividing by AR. Now we don't have the relative atomic masses in the question so let's look on the periodic table and if you do that you'll find that for carbon it is 12. So we're going to divide 1.5 by 12. And for hydrogen, we will find that it the answer is uh, is one. Okay, so we're going to divide hydrogen by one. So 1.5 divided by 12 is going to give us 0.125, and 0.5 divided by one is going to give us 0.5. Okay. Now it says divide each answer by the smallest answer. The smallest answer is 0.125. So if we divide that by 0.125, we're going to get 1. And if we divide 0.5 by 0.125, we will get 4. So what that tells us is that uh, in this compound, for every one carbon, there are four hydrogens. So our empirical formula becomes CH4. 
reacting masses questions are ones that ask us, you know, if you've got five grams of substance A, how much of substance B will you make? Or if you've got uh, 10 grams of substance B, how much of substance A will react with it? Or if you want to make 50 grams of substance B, how much of substance A do you need? Okay, but they all follow the same pattern. So in this one, we're gonna ask ourselves, what mass of water, H2O, can be produced from 64 grams of oxygen, according to the following equation? Okay. And uh, we're going to start out by writing out the information from the question under the relevant symbols in the equation. So it's telling us what mass of water. So water is one of our relevant things. We don't know the mass of water because we're being asked it. So we're just going to leave that as X because that is an unknown. But for oxygen, we do know something. It says 64 grams. So we're going to put 64 for water. OK. Everything else can be ignored. We don't need to think about hydrogen at all because it's not mentioned in the question. So we can just scribble it out and pretend it's not there. Next thing is it says calculate the MR of each of the relevant formulas okay, and multiply by the coefficient in the equation. The coefficient is the number in front of a compound in an equation. So um, these twos, for example. OK, so we're going to have for oxygen our coefficient is one so we're going to find one times the mr of oxygen okay which is going to equal one times oxygen uh is uh has a relative atomic mass of 16 so we're going to have one times two lots of oxygen so one times 2 times 16 that is going to just be 32 in total okay over here on the water side we're going to want two lots of the mr of water so two times the mr of h2o so if we actually work out that relative formula so two times hydrogen has got two water's got two hydrogens so two times h and one oxygen one times o so that is two times hydrogen has a mass of one, so two times one. Oxygen has a mass of 16, so one times 16. So that ends up coming to 36. Okay. Now the clever bit is that if you look at the way this is written, okay, 64 is over 32 and x is is over 36. Now reacting masses problems are actually ratio problems and the way this is written is now presented as a ratio problem with an unknown to solve. So we're going to turn this into a fraction with 64 and 32 as one half of the fraction. So 64 over 32 is going to equal x our unknown over 36. And now we can just rearrange to solve for x. So this rearranges to x equals 64 over 32, okay, times by 36. And if we just stick that into a calculator, that becomes 72 grams is our units. And so there is our final answer. To calculate the amount of a chemical in moles, remember first of all that the number of moles of a substance is just the quantity of chemicals. So moles is the unit of measurement for chemical substances. So um, we're going to have a four-step process. So we're going to first of all calculate the relative mass of the compound. Then we're going to write out the moles equation. Then we're going to substitute in our values and then we're going to solve it. So nice and easy. Looks more complicated than it is. So in this question, what quantity in moles is present in 69 grams of ethanol, which is C2H5OH? So it says start off by calculating MR for the compound. So we're going to do MR of ethanol, C2H5OH, okay, equals 2 times carbon plus 6 times hydrogen, because look, we've got 5 there, but also that one there. So 6 times hydrogen plus one times oxygen because this is just one oxygen okay so carbon has a relative mass of 
12. It's not given in the question here, but we can find it from the periodic table. So we're going to say 2 times 12 plus hydrogen has a mass of 1, so 6 times 1. And oxygen has a mass of 16, so 1 times 16. And that comes to 46 in total. Okay. Now we're going to write out our moles equation. So moles equals mass over molar mass. Okay. So we've just found the molar mass because that is the same as the relative mass. So we, we're dividing by 46. Okay. We've got uh, 69 grams up here was the mass given in the equation. So we're going to put 69 there. And if we do that, it comes to 1.5 and the units is mole. So that is our final answer. Well done for getting this far. You have reached the end of this presentation. As I said right at the very beginning, make sure that listening isn't all you're doing. You must do stuff that makes you think because when you think, you learn. Thank you and goodbye.